through this as a view from the south to north with Hawaii at center and you can kind of see here is that big zone of red that actually feeds other parts of the Pacific then we kind of come off separate to Hawaii from off of that so there is our Hawaiian plume imaged by earthquakes it looks like that and not only that they've done models with flow, like how the how the, the the material is actually flowing within these areas, right? So you can kind of see. Maybe you guys can't see so easily those little arrows, kind of showing the flow directions within here. So we're going to fo focus in on the actual Hawaiian plume. So if, if we can kind of just just look at that phase right here, Hawaii is right here, top and center, and that is our 3D Hawaiian plume, right? Kind of at the edge of this other big blob that exists to our south and west. Over here, I'm not sure which color to use there, and a little bit less connected in these couple of slices right in here. Right, but there probably if some other view that connects these things together. And there it is. That's the Hawaiian hotspot, French and Romanowitz. Now there's a caveat. Um, caveat is that uh, this has been tried. If, several times right and sometimes what you find is that you don't have the resolution this is bottom look at this bottom image first it's kind of showing if you're on a surface and you have space uh, all your seismic stations space at five kilometers um and your aperture is 160 kilometers right here then resolution kind of like a camera where can you get the best focus it's an area it's a triangle kind of that goes underneath here you can see pretty well in this square but once you're outside of that, you're in a poor range, poor resolution. So depending on how you do this, some people call it a little bit of magic. Sometimes you don't produce a plume image, right? So kind of a caveat, maybe there is one, maybe there isn't. What's going on up here? Maybe this is accurate. Maybe this is that kind of shallow dragging part, and this is that deeper part, but it's really hard to see what's going on. And that's because of this resolution issue, which is always an issue. This is why we leave it to the experts to, to publish the, all this kind of really intense research we do have a super chat that just came through from gary bryan it says very complex many unknowns thank you we also had oh, one gary. on why tracker from brian b thank you guys appreciate it mahalo mahalo so here's also, a we are gonna i am collecting questions to get into the chat and we will be doing those at the end yeah for sure i'm sure there'll be all kinds of questions and i have to have to jump back in here Oh, you have no idea. <laughs> I'm sure that every every thing I put up generates probably ten questions. So uh, here, for example, is a, a little bit of that caveat in play. Two different views of the Iceland plume, and on the left we have a publication by I'm not sure how to say these gentlemen's names or these people's names, B. Ward and Spackman, ninety nine, and also Red Seven ninety nine with a similar kind of uh, study found no deep hotspot for Iceland, whereas a deep spot was imaged by Beerward and Spackman. So depending on how you tune it, how you focus it, how you turn the dials and how you analyze the data, there's a little bit of art and subjectivity here too. So, you know, um, this is why this is a very complicated field. And one of the big issues is trying to deploy more seismometers to really see what's going on. So what do we see elsewhere? Here's another one. This is Yellowstone. So here is a USGS image, um, actually uh, publishing University of Texas research. And here from very deep down, 2,500 kilometers at least, 2,800 kilometers is the boundary. We see a mantle plume coming up to the shallow area, right, um, right under where Yellowstone is. So same thing, same caveats, but once you can focus, someone can focus in on it, then it kind of leads to more research and you know more interest in an area. You know, what's going on over here? So that's the whole basin and range, probably, yeah. extension of the whole uh, southwest area of this North American continent. That's a story for another day. But that's why there's young volcanoes, you know, that are active volcanoes less than 10,000 years old in Arizona and New Mexico. It's this kind of thing. So, all right, 
uh, here's here is a kind of a, a, a lengthwise view under North America, um, Great Lakes, kind of over here, and you kind of see some interesting things. We actually have these slower areas in blue. That's our continent, right? With you actually see where the glaciers were. The mantle is flowing back up. It's like someone got up up got up off the waterbed, and it's springing back into shape. Right? The glaciers melt pretty quickly, and then the mantle adjusts slowly, so the mantle is kind of filling back in, and that's why you get earthquakes in Michigan. In New York and areas like that. It's because of that kind of process and that kind of adjustment. Right? And there's kind of that whole spreading in American West kind of area, right? But if we look at just the blue thing now, we can notice there's actually two more things over here, right? There's actually two older submerged slabs that seem to be in this case or seem kind of stuck there. There's a gap between them and the core. But there is a little blue blob under here under North America as well. Right? So what's going on there? Like you know, so you can, obviously you can see that there's some history of the Earth preserved. This is what this is what's been termed uh, by one of my old advisors as a fossil slab. And here's a study of his, looking at 200 million years ago uh, over underneath Siberia, closing of the Mongol Okhotsk Ocean. I probably butchered that name as well. But you similarly see two big slot, big big blobs of slower material, right? And the idea being that if material is colder then the seismic energy can travel through it faster, and that's why it's that 1% faster. And if it's hotter, then it goes through it slower, and that's why it's that 1.5% slower. And so you see this, those slow areas, but you also see hot areas. So former ocean that's all the way closed, and now there's a continent sitting over, over where there used to be an ocean that closed, over here, all of North Asia. And then you have the active Pacific Plate, Subducting right here, and you have a big blob of it seemingly deformed, but actually connecting all the way down against the core of the earth and what he's termed a fossil slab graveyard. Right, so these are the fossil slabs and the ones that can actually penetrate all the way down and collect against the core are the ones populating this graveyard, these fossil slabs. Now this is obviously a real conundrum, right? You're going to get some of this really cold surface material, these old crusts of the earth, and you're going to pile it through the whole mantle, not remelt it, but keep it coherent until it actually piles against the core of the earth. Now, it's, it can't end like that. And so one obvious solution is that you have heat flow from the core into these cool areas, right, to kind of equilibrate. And after some time, once it actually equalizes, the heat flow doesn't just shut off instantly. It kind of keeps flowing in there and essentially you have areas that go from being heat sinks to being heat uh, net heat positive right so that from that point they want to become buoyant and rise up so but let's look at that boundary first and so here's a image from jean lois and thorn lay in 2005 and um structure of the earth and now they're actually putting in a little more detail of what's happening in here and these kind of lower limits here kind of the first little hint at this, what they call the D double prime layer, a very special seismic layer, and this is why. If we look at this image here on the left, I'll read it to you guys. On this left side here is depth in kilometers, so all the way down to here it's 6,000, so this is the center of the Earth over here, right? The core boundary is right there. So all this is the mantle. The crust would be just right up here, like a really thin little thing. So when you kind of see all the lines having this variation, that's all within the crust of the Earth at the very, very, very top. So when you get to, let's look at the first thing, this blue line is density. The density at the surface, you can see climbs with depth. More slowly through the mantle, once it hits the core, it jumps up, right, by over a factor of two. So the density of the core is an order of two greater than the density of the stuff in the mantle, right? So we're looking at that stuff trying to penetrate, these slabs trying to penetrate into the core, they can't do it, right? It's two times denser. It's like trying to walk through a wall. It just can't happen. Right? So that's... And then within the core, you see an increase, another jump. I can't make... Increase, another jump. And into the center there. I got a bug on my computer seems to do that, so, sorry guys. All right, so, 
that's the most important thing here is the density and how you, how you can't really can't really penetrate through there. If we look at the actual uh, wave velocity over here, density is plotted down here in the bottom actually. Wave velocity is up here in the top. And that's what this shear rate velocity is over here. Kind of increasing through the mantle, disappearing in the outer core, reappearing in the inner core. You have your P waves that also increase with depth. Right? There's some complexity in here, which is kind of the whole crust mantle boundary and the moho and all of that, which is not relevant today as much. Um, but they increase all the way down as well. So you can kind of see that this is the place where all these things change. It's a D double prime layer, and that's why it's a layer of interest to seismologists and researchers. So if we look at just a the thermal effect of the of the core, you might it might not be quite enough. Some some models kind of just show instead of showing a whole plume that kind of comes up, it might start trying to come up, but then you just end up having these hot fingers that dissipate. So it may be that temperature by itself is not quite enough. And what's turned out is that there's been quite a lot of research done um, now using diamond anvils. And so in this kind of summary, this is kind of what this what it looks like. You take two diamonds and you put your material that you want to study in the middle of here. And in this case, what they were trying to study is two materials. They are studying iron as a representative of the core of the earth. And they're putting in what they think is a mantle material, something that's technically a magnesium perovskite, but it's kind of it's kind of a cousin of olivine. Think of it that way, right? It's kind of, you know, that, that kind of same similar kind of thing rearranged. And so they put it they put it in there. They can squeeze it to the pressures found at, at the depths that these reactions are occurring. They can also, because this is diamond, they can shoot a laser through the diamond and heat up the sample to whatever temperature they need until it's like glowing hot, whatever temperature, and then they can actually then simulate the temperature of the core mantle boundary. And it's really been the, the advent of this kind of technology that's allowed us to study the kind of reactions that happen. And they can kind of see like, okay, if you put iron against that magne magnesium perovskite, you, you, you actually start reacting them. They react instantly. And there's a clear effect. And so that's something that, that happens. And so without going into the detail of the chemistry of it, I'm going to show you guys some of the detail of this now, that you have a reaction zone Right, where you have this kind of downward convection of mantle material, mantle material, and possibly some of those fossil slabs, and as soon as they touch any any of this liquid iron, right, liquid iron alloy in here with whatever other impurities it's got, sulfur and nickel and whatever else is in there, as soon as that happens, it starts reacting, and that reactant reaction produces these dregs, which are kind of piling up up here, over here, and quite possibly also influencing this upper part of the outer core of the earth that's actually spinning at this meters per second rate. So it's not only a temperature effect, but it's also a chemical effect, right? You're having a chemical reaction happening. And that chemical reaction is producing this material, right? That's, that's creating a topography on this core mantle boundary. Okay, so we have a new paradigm for this whole situation, right? So here in the center, we have Hawaii. And so we have that kind of cores down there. We have that ultra low velocity zone. We have this area of melt inclusions. We have that D double prime layer. And we have through all that, our mantua plume coming up. And there's other areas where you see that structure is actually much higher. And next to it, you see these strands of other hotspot plumes that kind of come off the side. And it turns out if we zoom into Hawaii, we actually do have one of these over here next to us as well, kind of over here that's not really drawn in this particular view, right? But you can also have these other zones that may park deeper within the Earth and become inactive hotspots between South America and Africa, for example, or be still connected and erupting like Galapagos, for example, areas like that. But it's all driven at the surface, which is why I started talking about this, by what's happening down 1,800 miles down, 2,800 kilometers down below us at this core mantle boundary. So when we start imagining, okay, so it's coming from the core mantle boundary, how, how is it actually getting here? How does, you know, how, if the material is actually rising, what does it do? And it turns out that this material as it rises, 
starts off, kind of you can't really see. I'm gonna draw it right, draw it right here. The, the first little little rising die up here looks about like this shape and size, and it's all solid because the material rising up essentially is encountering friction on the outside, right? So you kind of have friction on the outside of this rising amount of material. And so the very top of this can't rise as quickly as material can move through the middle of this conduit. So you kind of end up feeding the head of this plume faster than the plume itself is rising. The plume starts wrapping back on itself on the sides more and more and more. This one's wrapped all the way over like that. Right, until eventually, imagine by the time it gets to the surface, it's totally wrapped up and you have a much broader area of hot material that wants to erupt than the actual plume started off being. But once you might get past that first phase, phase of massive, massive eruption, geologically survive it because it's a millions and millions of years process, then you might have this established plume that can kind of come up and feed from below to the crust. So this is kind of how we imagine that the plumes rise up from the core mantle boundary towards the surface of the Earth. And here is a, a TASA Graphics Arts image showing that. This has been used by USGS. Uh, core mantle boundary. There you have that material, the rising plume that has a head. Once it hits the surface of the Earth, then it creates large areas of eruptions at the same time, which are termed flood basalts. Right? If you guys have heard flood basalts, often related to this hotspot initiation, and also sometimes called large igneous provinces, lips. And after that initial plateau is carried away from the hotspot, then you have your trail kind of following behind it. So that's kind of the, the, the overall model.